We're live. Oh, I I love it when it pops up on there. You're live because that means we we are connected, and so far things are working. I had had a little bit of issue here this morning getting hooked up on the internet. I I uh, <clears throat> I, I have nightmares about uh, internet issues related to Ask the Agronomist. So welcome everyone to uh, the first episode of Believe It or Not Season Three of Ask the Agronomist. So uh, we we ended up last season with a great episode. At least it was great fun for Adam and I to get to go to uh, University of Illinois to uh, sit down with Dr. Bilo and uh, and had a great conversation with Dr. Bilo. We went about an hour and a half on that episode. So if you want to get your fill uh, or, uh, or, or get a hit uh, of Dr. Bilo, check out the, uh, the last episode of Ask the Agronomist. And, and if you want more Dr. Bilo, which who doesn't want more Dr. Bilo, uh, he will be our keynote speaker at our Yield Chasers Banquet, which is coming up uh, here in a few weeks, uh, February 2nd, right, Adam? What what day of the week is that? Well, that is a Thursday. That's a Thursday. So Thursday, February 2nd um, in in the Peoria Heights, I believe, is the actual address of the of the venue. Yep. And, to, <laughs> and to get an opportunity to win a ticket to come to that banquet, you need to be one of two things. You needed to be a participant in our Yield Chaser contest, which that contest closed the end of the year. Adam is going to announce our winners here this morning of, uh, of that contest. And, and the, basically the intent of the banquet is to celebrate the success of, of all of the people who participated in the contest, showcase the winners, hand out some prizes, and we'll have Dr. Bilo there to, uh, to give us some really good content and good information and, and uh, always enjoy listening to uh, to Dr. Bilo speak. So very excited about our first Yield Chaser Banquet. The, success, the, the contest was a great success. We had good participation. We had some phenomenal yields. I'm, I'm very proud of the farmers for the yields that they achieved, and I'm very proud of the products they used to achieve those yields. Now, now in a few cases, um, it's going to pour a little salt in the wound because there's a there's one particular hybrid that that showed up pretty strong in yield chasers that the guys have been sold out of for several weeks now. So that that's just going to add a little insult to injury for for, for those guys on the on the soybean side though. I, I am proud to say that uh, 35 XF1 and 38 XF1 mopped up in uh, in yield chasers this year. So uh, thanks to our high yield soybean producers that are planting high yielding genetics like 35 XF1 and 38 XF1. Uh, <clears throat> I, I will give a little bit of um, a little bit of a warning to those of you out there who, like me, did not raise any 80 or 90 or certainly not any 100 bushel soybeans this year. Uh, our yield chaser participant winners um, actually did manage to raise uh, 90 plus and even 100 plus bushel soybeans in some cases. So there were some areas out there where soybean yields were very, very, very good. Uh, probably more areas where soybean yields were very, very, very average. Uh, but uh, our, our contest uh, winners uh, still achieved some phenomenal soybean yields. So you'll probably, you might, you know, some of the soybean yields might, you might raise your eyebrows a little bit. Uh, corn yields probably won't surprise you much because I think a lot of us saw some 300 bushel spots in cornfields this year. And, and, uh, and, and that's, that's probably what it's going to take to win this contest year in and year out is, is corn that starts with a three and, and beans that start with a nine or a one probably. So, um, and that one number would be a three digit number, uh, by the way. So anyway, uh, Adam, while we're on the subject of yield chasers, uh, you, you got the list of our, of our winners. Yes, I do. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you to everybody who participated in our process of the inaugural West Central Illinois Yield Chasers Contest. So, had some fun there. A lot of people, uh, you know, were interested in it, and we had split our team into the North Pod and the South Pod. And basically, all that means is the North half of our team and the South half of our team. Pod is just a goofy term for a sub team within a team. So we've got our north. It's it's like a we got we got two things here at Bear. We got pods and we got funnels. And I won't explain what you use a funnel for and what a pod does, but we we call these teams pods. And I 
<laughs> I don't care how long I work here. I'm I'm probably never going to like the term pod. But anyway, I'm I'm in one. I actually help lead a pod. Um, but anyway, so I digress. So so given the fact that we got two pods, we'll have winners for Asgro and Cal for each pod. That's how we have it set up this year. So top top three, right? Top three, yeah. yep, yep. Winners top three for the North Pod Asgro, North Pod DeKalb, and then the same for the South Pod. So I'll get started on the North Pod. And we'll go now big order. So we'll start with Asgro. Uh, John Emmerich took first place in the North Pod with a yield of 93 bushel. Awesome. Using 38 XF1s. Uh, ben Way Onken, to go, John. Yeah, good job, John. Thank you very much. Ben Onken came in close second at 90.9. With 38 XF1s. Awesome. Jim Shut Onken, up. third place, very, very close, 90.7 with 31 XF2. See, our 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 good customers here, they're they're smart. They're just like the NCGA folks. I mean, you you enter your dad, you enter your brother, you enter your wife, you enter your kids. There might be some pets entered. You know, you get lots of <laughs> when you, you got get, a hot spot, you, the you, family gets big. You, you get <laughs> lots of entries with the same last names, all I'm saying. Hey, good strategy. That's the way it goes. That's the way it goes. So, thank you very much. The Asgro North Pod, those are our winners. DeKalb North Pod, Scott Allison, with an impressive 309.57 bushels. I was in that field this summer. It was a damn oh, yeah. good looking field of corn. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. it yielded damn well, too. Yep. Yep. Uh, he was using 6618 mm -hmm. in that particular field, which has been a phenomenal hybrid for us. That's the one I mentioned <laughs> earlier that the guys need a little help selling. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We're sold out, man. <laughs> We're sold out. UTAs, just don't listen. <laughs> Great job, Scott. Great I think your there. TAs have been telling people to plant more of that for three freaking years now, and they finally listen. Uh, great job, Scott. Brian Anderson coming in second at 303.13 bushels. Using awesome. 6618 again. Great job, Brian. Uh, RM Farms, 302.25 bushels using good old hybrid 6794. Awesome. So that is the North Pod Asgro and DeKalb. Moving on to the South Pod. Editorial comment here to help out my sellers. 6618, people are a little over the moon crazy for that. 6794, underutilized hybrid. So uh, yeah. if you're uh, if you're frustrated that you can't get a few more, few more bags of 6618, use some 6794. Excellent opportunity there with that product. We still have product available as well. South Pod Asgro, number one, Jacob Meyer at an unbelievable 115 bushels oh, an acre. 115. That that is very, very impressive. I had Jacob. some corn that made 115, Adam. <laughs> Good Lord. <clears throat> very, very impressive yield, uh, particularly given the yield, the year, sorry, that we had with soybean this year. What was the variety on that? Sorry, the variety was 35 XF1. Oh, awesome. I love it when a plan comes together. It was uh, it was a great year for Jacob Meyer in that field, and I really hope the field did well because uh, that is an impressive yield. Jared Stock, second place at 109 bushel, using another Asgro favorite, 38 XF1. Awesome. Very impressive. Steve Meyer. Still cracking the 100 bushel yeah. breach of yeah. 101 bushels an acre with an entry of 35 XF1. I, I have a bit of a hard time envisioning raising 101 bushel beans and coming in third in a contest. That, I know. that I know. you know that's almost frustrating, but you know that's uh, that's quite impressive for uh, all of our. <clears throat> and I said all summer Cal had better beans, and apparently he did because uh, all three of uh, our our contestant winners. Uh, on the Asgro side, we're over 100 bushel in the South Pod, so that's cool. So excellent job there uh, on those raising those beans. Great year, great job managing because that is uh, those are impressive yields, very impressive. <laughs> uh, decal down on the South Pod. We actually have four people to announce because okay. we have a tie for third. But I will start with the winner, Mr. Joe Meyer, at 304 bushels an acre using decal 6270. Awesome amazingly good yield. Uh, we have got another 300 bushel winner entry at second place 
and it is 300 exactly using the Cal. You'll like this one, Cal Al, an old favorite of yours. Six seventy twenty seven. The Calb seventy twenty seven is what Matthew Meyer used to race three hundred. I was afraid you were going to say sixty two oh six for a minute. No, <laughs> that's an inside joke. <laughs> Good job, Joe. I, I think seventy twenty seven also uh, is still, as far as I know, he still hasn't topped. It's still Doctor Velo's highest uh, yeah. yielding product yep. in at uh, in his trials over the years. I believe that is correct. It is still. Uh, <laughs> Still wearing that crown over there with Dr. Velo, which he's pushing everything to the limit. So. Yeah, very, very responsive to management hybrid. Those are the ones he's he likes. So we've got a tie for third place to Calb in the South Pod uh, region. Gary Meyer and Jacob Meyer both managed to grow 296 bushel of acre. Mm. Very impressive. Using two different decal products. 6794 again mm -hmm. on the list with Gary. And with Jacob Meyer, sixty-two eighty-nine. Nice. Okay. Well, and and and, and honestly, there's there, there's there's some logic to the products that are showing up in these contests. I mean, we were joking about sixty-six eighteen showing up a lot, but but three other hybrids in our lineup that probably have a top end yield, you know, as good or better than sixty-six eighteen would be the other three hybrids that showed up in the contest, and that would be. 6289, 6270, and 6794. So, so if you're, you know, if you're wanting to play around on your farm and see what kind of yield you can achieve next year and enter next year's yield chaser contest, which will hopefully be even bigger than bigger and better than this year's contest was, you know, those are some uh, hybrid options you could think about. Um, you know, no, uh, no 6606 on, on the list because it was just in plots a year ago. I think a lot of people will probably be uh, chasing some yield with 6606 in next year's contest, but uh, but those hybrids all probably, honestly, at the end of the day, have about an equal chance of coming out on top in uh, in any high yield yield contest. So good good products to choose. Thanks a lot to uh, all of our FSRs and all of our dealers who who badgered all of our good farmers into entering the contest. Hopefully everybody uh, enjoys the experience. Uh, the winners enjoy their gifts, um, and um, and and hopefully we get even more participation next year. So so hopefully this is the first of of many years to come of uh, of yield chase or yield contest, and um, and great be great to get together on February second with some uh, great growers and celebrate their great yields and and great products and uh, enjoy some time with with Dr. Bilo. So. With that, we will move on from uh, from yield chasers and get into some uh, some agronomics. And I'm going to start with uh, <clears throat> nitrogen management here this morning. And <clears throat> I'm not going to get terrible deep in the weeds. And and nitrogen management could be a, an entire episode. And there's about 50 different directions you could go with that. I'm going to focus in on one particular trend that concerns me a little bit. And it is <clears throat> strictly economics driven, and and I get it. We're we're in we're in this business to to make money, and economics certainly influence that. But in our business, yield probably influences your ability to make money more than economics do, even in some cases, or at least in some ways, because every bushel of corn, which we're talking about here, you know, is worth six plus dollars a bushel. And, and that's going to drive, you know, driving that gross income higher is probably your best odds of having a positive net income. But one, one thing we've got going on in the, in the fertilizer market is there is a probably, obviously no, no surprise to anyone, the price of nitrogen is elevated. The price of everything is elevated. So I'm not picking on nitrogen. It is what it is. But the price gap between solution, so UAN solution, and and hydrous in some cases was probably wider than normal. And although both are, are high, the price point on UAN in some cases really had some guys thinking about changing their nitrogen program. And one thing I've heard, I've heard this comment from several growers, and, and this is my concern, and this is why I'm bringing it up. Um, it's It's been a fairly common, I would say, good management practice to use UAN as a carrier for your 
pre-emergent herbicide application and get 30, 45, you know, maybe some guys use as much as 60 units of nitrogen out in the spring, either right before or right after planting using UAN solution as a carrier for your herbicide program. Works great, very common practice. Um, I've talked to a lot of guys that, that have volunteered to me that they put out an extra 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 units of nitrogen in the fall as anhydrous more than they normally do because that's their cheapest source of nitrogen. And they're going to either reduce or perhaps pull out that spring UAN application. And, and here's my concern with that. You may use the same amount of nitrogen total in the crop year, um, but the amount of nitrogen that those young corn plants are going to sense in your field next spring is going to be lower if you don't make the same spring application that you typically do. Until the roots of that corn plant get down into that anhydrous zone from the fall nitrogen application, which, yeah, it, it expands out but it, it's not going to move up to the surface. Um, so those roots are going to have to get down to that. Even if it's already in a nitrate usable, you know, plant usable form, until the roots get into it, those seedling corn plants don't even know that product's there. And just because of the, you know, soil microbes um, breaking down residue in the soil, tying up nitrogen to do that or, or using nitrogen to do that, they're going to absorb, that microbial biomass is going to absorb most of the readily available nitrogen at the surface. And if the only nitrogen that's out there is six or seven or eight inches deep, you know, that corn plant might be V6, V7, V8 before it really gets into that concentrated zone of, of nitrogen. And we've seen, and actually this kind of ties back to our yield chasers contest a little bit, or, you know, some of the high yield producers were the first ones to discover this, that if a corn plant senses when it's young, that it is in a nitrogen limiting environment, it gets conservative because that plant believes that, okay, I'm short on nitrogen. It doesn't know how much more you're planning to give it later. And <clears throat> once it senses that, hey, you know, there's not, not exactly an abundance of nitrogen here. Um, you know, I'm only going to try to yield 280 instead of sensing, holy cow, I got everything I want here. I'm going to try to yield 400. Well, you're going to end up at a better place if you start out trying to yield 400 versus starting out trying to yield 280. Because if you get conservative, you can't get that potential back later. And so the, the, the challenge with, this is also a challenge with nitrogen programs that spoon feed nitrogen on through the growing season, which sounds great and, and it does have benefits. And there are situations where that's the best thing to do. But the flip side of that is you got to make sure that early on when that plant um, doesn't need a tremendous amount of nitrogen, it does need enough nitrogen close to the roots so that it senses it's got plenty of nitrogen. You really don't want that plant to ever have a day in its life where it wishes it had more nitrogen than it did. Now, we don't necessarily need to be over applying nitrogen to accomplish that, but we got to make sure that we're putting on enough, you know, at planting in a plant available form that the plant can sense that, hey, life is good. Um, you know, and, and the amount it takes to do that is going to vary based on rotation. If you're corn on corn, I'm going to say 45 units is a minimum. I prefer 60. If you're on rotated ground, you know, sometimes you can get by without it. Kind of depends on the soil, organic matter, soil temperature, growing conditions, soil moisture. What's the rate of, of mineralization? You know, how many big rains have we had? Uh, lo lots of factors there. But I would say 30 to 45 units would, would be my ideal, you know, amount of, of nitrogen to apply close to planting in a plant available form. Got to focus on that on rotated ground and 45 to 60 units corn on corn. So if you're planning on pulling that application out or cutting that application back, just recognize that, that if, if those plants, when they're 
yay big, uh, are sensing that they're going to be a little short on nitrogen. They're going to pull back. They're going to get a little more conservative. That plant's not going to set the potential ear size that it could have, you know, had it sense that it had everything it was ever going to need. So just a caution um, that if you're trying to save money uh, by moving nitrogen from spring to fall and moving nitrogen from UAN to anhydrous, um, you, you, you could hurt yourself and yield more than you're going to help yourself in reduced nitrogen expense um, if, if that plant gets conservative on you. So I had a question come in, Lance. Uh, you know, a lot of different factors that influence nitrogen, as we all yeah. know. You mentioned this one in, in uh, passing in the conversation, but the Elliott Network had a great question. Want to know what impact 55 degree days have had on the fall anhydrous that we've applied? Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of questions about this back in the fall too, when we were having 75 and 80 degree days after some of those applications were made. So, um, you know, in a perfect scenario, um, you apply your fall nitrogen when soil temperatures are below 50 degrees, they don't get above 50 degrees and it stays dry and we have a moist, but not wet spring and timely planting, you know, in that scenario, Fall nitrogen is probably the best way to go. Um, you know, great uh, uh, from a workload perspective. It's great from a soil uh, quality perspective because being out there in the spring ahead of planting, uh, trying to apply nitrogen, you know, is not doing your soil uh, profile any favors from a compaction standpoint. The, the risk factors with those fall applications go up as you move them earlier in the, sea, in the fall as soil temperatures rise and as spring conditions get wetter. So, so, so far we're having a warm, what I would classify as a warm, wet winter, um, which is not ideal for those fall nitrogen applications. I don't think we've lost any fall nitrogen at this point. The way we're gonna lose fall nitrogen is typically in, in, a, in a well tiled central Illinois cornfield, it's gonna leach to the tile line. Um, not many tile lines running, you know, we are still, even though we've had what I would call a warm, wet winter and we've got some surface moisture, you know, at depth, it's probably still dry and we could probably still use some more moisture. So I don't think we've lost nitrogen at this point. I do think the warm fall and the warm winter does make me nervous if we end up with a late warm, wet spring, if we end up with a late warm, wet spring we could have significant nitrogen losses um, from those fall applications. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to be watching the spring conditions. I don't think at this point we've lost anything. I wouldn't be applying extra because of how the fall was or how the winter has been. Uh, but I do think we need to keep our eye on that. And if, uh, if it ends up being a, a warm, wet April and a warm, wet May, and we got corn getting planted in the middle of May instead of the middle of April, um, you know, that, that's the scenario that I would be concerned that uh, that we, you know, would have potentially lost some nitrogen. I also would uh, add to that. I'd, I'd probably look a lot at soil temperature information more so than the highs for the day. Obviously, the highs have an impact on the soil temperature, particularly right. at the very surface. Um, but we haven't necessarily had a super hot winter when it comes right. to soil temperatures from from what i've seen anyways. yeah yeah i mean we when it's 55 um in the afternoon on a sunny afternoon in january yeah that's 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 odd um but the soil's probably 40 um in, in most cases certainly is where that that nitro where that fertility has been applied it might get pretty warm in the top couple inches mm -hmm. but adam's right so soil, soil temperature is what's driving soil biological activity not air temperature so again i i don't think that um you know we probably got you know ho hopefully everybody's doing the right thing using using an inhibitor with their fall nitrogen if you didn't use an inhibitor with your fall nitrogen, most of it's probably already converted to nitrate at this point because of the warm fall conditions we had. So that's, you, you probably still haven't lost it, but it's all in the losable form. And, and if we end up with a wet spring, you could lose a lot of, the, of that product. But um, you know, I don't think those losses have happened yet. 
Um, I do think the potential is there. There are some factors that have probably increased the potential for loss. But uh, at, at this point, I, I don't really think we've lost anything that we that we applied. And, and hopefully we don't. Um, I, I know some of you that uh, are promoting some other nitrogen systems. Um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's an opportunity for some when things go wrong with, with nitrogen. And it's a problem for others. It depends on what, uh, what, what side of that uh, conversation you're on. But uh, from, a, from an environmental standpoint, economic standpoint, crop yield standpoint, you know, image of agriculture standpoint, never a good thing when nitrogen goes anywhere other than into a corn root, uh, which, is where we, which is where we want it to be. So good, good question. Anything else come in on chat, Adam? Not right now. Okay. All right. So appreciate the questions. Uh, got, got, our, uh, got our first, uh, first, first entrant into next yeah. year's uh, giveaway. Yeah, so right. speaking of that, so congratulations to Matthew Meyer. Um, uh, that Meyer name was all over Yield Chasers too. I, I don't, I don't know what those Meyer guys are doing, but uh, big may, family. Maybe hang out, ha hang out with some people named Meyer. Good things, good things will happen to you. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, Matt, Matthew was our uh, was our uh, winner of, of last year's. Uh, uh, we gave away a solo stove. I got together and had lunch with Matthew a couple weeks ago, and and gave him his stove. So, uh, so congrats to, to him. And, and again, thanks to all of our viewers and, and especially, um, I, you're not supposed to have favorites, but I, you know, my, my favorites are people that, that ask questions. Uh, so, so thank you to those of you who are, are bold enough, brave enough to, uh, to chat in a question and, and that just, that does nothing but make the program better. If there are no questions, the only thing that happens is Lance is going to go on and on and on and on about something that you might not care about. So, uh, so if you want to save yourself from that, ask some questions. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's dive a little bit into, uh, uh, seed, seeding rates, populations. Um, this is kind of top of my mind. I, I just, refreshed, updated, um, look through last year's results of our population research trials. And, I, and I'm proud of the work that we do here at, at Bear, And we've done this for, you know, since we were Monsanto, there's been several years going into this. I don't know what year we're up to, probably our sixth or seventh year of what we call gen testing. And, and gen testing is, is just our, our population research. And we are at lots of locations across the Midwest replicated trials, you know, planted. Um, we, we go to go to farmer's field and do these trials, but we plant them, we harvest them. Every commercial hybrid that we ever sell, as well as a lot of our that are getting near the end of the breeding program that could become new commercial releases, we try to get those in there. We, we like to have a year's worth of population data. Actually, we're, our goal is to have two years worth of population data on every hybrid before we ever sell it. And we don't always accomplish that, but we do most of the time and that's the goal. So, so we've got hybrids that we've got five or six years of, of seeding rate data on. And, and the way we generate this data is we plant all these hybrids at a wide range of populations, much lower than you would ever plant and much higher than you would ever plant. And we put these trials out all across the, the corn belt and take them to yield. And, and that's how we determine, you know, what we call the, the population response curve for, for each hybrid. And, and every hybrid has a population response curve. Yeah, I got to get a new marker. Yeah, so it looks like it's time for a different one. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Virtually every hybrid, not virtually every, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do something you're not supposed to do. I'm going to say every hybrid has a population response curve that, look, that looks like that. They, 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 they go up slowly. As you increase population, it starts to level off, level off, level off, and then it dips ever so slightly. And, th and that's the part that does change a little bit. Dips ever so slightly if you overshoot the mark. But if you'll notice, this, uh, th this, this curve is not proportional. So it's, it's not like that, right? It, it's... It, your penalty of underseeding, which would be down in this world, is bigger than your penalty from a yield standpoint of overseeding. So your main penalty penalty of overseeding is you're just wasting money. 
you're not really achieving less yield. Now you can impact your standability. You can slightly, and I'll show you some curves here in a minute with some actual data. Um, there are some hybrids that that tail tips dips off. And the other thing I would say is this tail dips sharper in lower yield environments. So, so if you're in a 180 bushel yield environment, you're gonna see more drop off than if you're in a 290 bushel yield environment. If you're in a 290 bushel yield environment, it just kind of flattens out, but it doesn't really ever drop off. So, so I'm gonna to try to use the camera here. Hopefully I can find these now that I've told you I was gonna show you. So <clears throat> I'm just gonna pick, oh, let's just, let's just irritate Adam. Let's let's pick sixty six eighteen just for just for you know what's and giggles. So can I get it to? We have to put your orientation. Okay, on. help me, Adam. I, even, I, even, even though you're trying to make my life more difficult, I, I he's, you that's the that's the kind of guy Adam is. I'm 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 picking on him and he's saving me at the same what, time. What did it? Uh, I just got here. Let me get your orientation on. <laughs> there you go. Now you can find it again. All right. I accidentally hit done. Cool. Okay. All right. Well. Maybe I can find it again. There we go. All right. There we go. Okay. My sent items folder disappeared for a minute. Yeah, that was my bad. I accidentally hit done while I was trying to put your orientation lock on. Yeah, it'll come to, there we go. Okay, now I'm back and here's the file. All right. So, do, do, do. So it's locked, but it's locked vertical. No, you can you lock it horizontal? It. Yep, I can do that. Can you lock yeah. it horizontal without closing my, yes. my, yes. my sent items folder? I can. <laughs> I will be more careful with my thumb placement. <clears throat> Neither Adam or I have small fingers. Should be locked on there. Let me know if that's what you want. I don't know, but it'll work. No. Oh. Can you can you lock it horizontal? It should. It should be locked. I know, but I want to look at it. Oh, that oh way. okay. Sorry. Is that possible? It is. Yeah. It is. Okay. Quality programming this morning. Thanks for sticking with us. I can work with it if it won't stay that way. Just like that. Oh, beautiful. Thanks, bud. Yep. Okay. So now I'm gonna since Adam was since Adam was so kind, let's do sixty six oh six instead. So <clears throat> the other, the other thing <laughs> he's he's gonna tell me that's not really helping any because we're sold on that one too. So <clears throat> so basically what you're looking at here, and I and I hope you can see it. Um at Adam can kind of I'm gonna change the tip here a little bit. So, so here's our yield response curves. There's five of them because I've got five different yield environments in there. If you can read the numbers on the curves, the first number with the blue star is what we call the economic optimum seeding rate. And some of those numbers are big, right? You're going, holy crap, you guys must sell seed for a living. The, if you really want to say that, the bigger number is the yield optimum seeding rate. So if you're not worried about economics and you're just trying to achieve the maximum yield possible with the Calb 6606 next year, and you're trying to win next year's yield chaser contest, and you're trying to raise 300 bushel corn, holy crap, this data says you, you need to plant that corn thick. And, and that's what most, you get in NCGA yield contest results, you don't find anybody planting 35,000 plants per acre that's winning NCGA. It's, you know, 45 plus generally. So the five curves are five different yield environments. So if you look at those yield environments ranging from a low of 170 to a high of 290, look at how much the optimum population changes on that hybrid. And that's not unique to this hybrid. They all look like that. I'll pull up another one here in a minute, and you'll probably be a little surprised, at least my perception is you'll be surprised, 
at how little difference there is between um, different hybrids. But look at the dramatic difference that yield makes. So <clears throat> I'll pull this up, maybe a little bit easier way to look at it. This chart here, if you just want to look at the numbers. So if you want to look at the numbers of optimal seeding rates based on different yield levels for this hybrid. Most hybrids look similar. And if you're in a lower yield environment, I could put 65.95 up there, but that would scare people too much. It's crazy high, crazy high. Um, let's see, where's another, uh, here, good. One of our new hybrids, another new hybrid we're excited about, 64.22. So <clears throat> you probably, you know, unless you screenshotted it, you might not remember exactly what 6606 looked like, but you might think that, well, boy, that looks kind of, looks kind of the same as the last one you showed me. And, and honestly, I could show you 50 different curves for 50 different hybrids. They all follow the same trend. The higher your yield goal, the thicker you need to plant them. And you'll notice with most of them, if you plant them too thick, your yield does nothing but go up a little bit. Now, it doesn't go up enough to pay for the seed you spent. So that's why the economic optimum is lower than the yield optimum. But we do this for every hybrid. We've done this for every hybrid for, I don't know, six, seven, eight years, probably. Um, we will continue to do this for every hybrid. And, and I think it's really cool. And we are going to make population recommendations based on that data. We spend millions of dollars a year generating the data. We've got more data on population, I think, than anybody else in the industry. And we're going to utilize that data to make seeding rate recommendations. Now, how you use those recommendations on your farm depends a little bit on, you know, what's your planter technology like, what's your willingness to consider um, variable rate seeding, you know, what's your capacity to do scripting, um, those sorts of things, because every field out there has yield variability in it. And the number one driver for what is the optimum population is not how much nitrogen you use, is not planting date, is not hybrid genetics, is not whatever you think it might be. It's what's that part of the field going to yield. And the more a region in a field has uh, yields, has demonstrated yield potential in the past with historical yield data, you know, we're going to vary that seeding rate based on yield. Now, there's a lot of factors I see people using for seed, uh, seeding rate variation. So you can get, you can get really cute with scripts. You can look at soil type. You can look at soil organic matter. You can look at soil CEC. You can look at soil fertility. You can look at soil nitrogen or how much nitrogen you're using. You can look at hybrid. You can uh, get really fancy and you can have um, EC or Varus data, electrical conductivity. At the top of this list, I'm going to put yield. I'll try to spell it right. If you've got yield data, good grief. <laughs> yield data is going to trump all of this. And if you've got good yield data, I don't think you need any of these other things that we listed on here. And I don't think you can build a script 
using all this other stuff. And, and if you do do it just right, what you're doing is you're accounting for how all of these different soil property factors affect this one. But rather than doing it indirectly, I'd just do it directly. I'd use the yield data. We've all got yield data, hopefully. Uh, we should all have high quality yield data. If you don't, I'd start trying to get high quality yield data. And if a region of your field has been yielding really well, so let, let's say really well is, if you've got a spot in your field that's been yielding 300 bushel, Okay, all right. Getting a glare right there. Oh, uh, yeah. probably from that light right there. Yeah. So <clears throat> if you've got a region in your field that's been yielding 300 bushel, planted at 36,000, because that's where you've been planting the whole field, and you're managing this spot the same way that you're managing this spot over here, that's been yielding 240, planted at 36,000. Managing it the same as this spot over here, that's been yielding 210, at 36,000. These are three vastly different regions of your field that need three different populations. You've probably never given these regions of your field three different populations. And this one that has somehow managed to yield 300 with a low seeding rate of 36,000, if the optimum seeding rate for that region is 42,000, if you've never planted that spot at 42,000, you don't have any idea how much it would have yielded if it wasn't underseeded. <clears throat> Conversely, this spot down here, you're wasting probably three or four or maybe 5,000 seeds per acre, which is quite a bit of money these days. People tell me seeds expensive <clears throat> on that spot. And you could lower that seeding rate maybe down to 31,000 and still raise the same 210. So we're not necessarily going to use more seed, but you're going to distribute it differently across the field. And, and unless you can show me yield maps from your fields where the yield doesn't change, there's opportunity to do this in every field that's out there. Now, if, you're, if your yield range is 25 bushel across an 80, well, that's, that's pretty uniform. Uh, if your yield's varying 100 bushel across an 80, that's what I'd call normal. And a highly variable field, your yield might vary 200 bushel across an 80. I mean, I've got some fields that got sand pockets in them. The sand pocket might have made 50. And the best part of the field was 250. And there's a lot of opportunity. And, and the, the, the scripts can be... You know, it's technology. All technology can pose challenges at times. You got to have good yield data. You got to do some ground truthing. You know, you got to be careful with it because, you know, if, if you got an area of a field that has been yielding very poorly because it's wet and you tile it and it now becomes one of the best parts of the field, well, all that historical yield data is skewed by the fact that that used to be a wet hole. Um, you also need to be careful in those especially wet areas that can pond. You know, you get a couple years where that spot ponded out, it's going to really, really, really lower your yield average from that area. And we don't necessarily want to be planting those ponds at 24,000 seeds per acre just because of the years where it drowned it out. So, so you got to, you know, you, you, you got to use some common sense. You, you can't rely 100% on the technology. You, you got to put your knowledge of your farm and your field into that equation to make sure that you don't make a mistake. Question, Adam? No. no okay. Not on population. I have so, a question coming in about nitrogen. But okay. All right. Nitrogen. Good. We'll, we'll go back to that. So, <clears throat> so if you've, if you've never done any scripting, um, you know, talk with your dealer, talk with your FSR, um, you know, if you want to do it through climate, it's super easy, very economical. If you want to make them, you're on your own. There's, there's options to, to do a manual script that are free. Um, you know, personally, I'd, I'd pay the buck and, and let the technology do it for you. 
Um, if you've got enough acres that saving a dollar an acre seems to be important to you, then, then you, can, you can build your own for free. But really what you need, in my opinion, you, you need good yield data. And if you've got good yield data, you don't really need anything else to generate a, a good script. If you don't have good yield data, you can use imagery, which very closely represents a yield map typically. If you don't have anything, um, you know, it's, it's hard to build. You know, I, I wouldn't use soil type myself because soil type doesn't correlate that well to yield because the soil maps are not, are not as good as your yield maps. Um, you know, fertility doesn't correlate to yield typically very well at all. Often there's an inverse correlation between fertility and yield because that spot I drew up here that's been yielded 300, you've never fertilized it for 300 bushel corn. You've been fertilizing it for the field average. So you've always underplanted and underfertilized that spot. And somehow it's still yielding 300 bushel. Um, so until we put the right amount of fertilizer on that spot and the right amount of seed in that spot, we really don't know how good the best parts of your field could be. And the poorest parts of your field are going to be the poorest parts of your field no matter what you do. Um, we just need to not be wasting money on the poorest parts of the field. So what was the nitrogen question, Adam? Um, we, we, so, everybody loves nitrogen questions. Oh, absolutely. So Mike had a question. You want to know if we had any thoughts on a couple different types of nitrogen. Okay. That would be supplement and, and then hydrous program. Okay. <clears throat> He doesn't have any fertilizer equipment on the planter, but he's wanting to know if he's adding a, another 50 units of nitrogen, uh, whether that nitrogen is dry urea or whether that's 32%, if you had any thoughts on the difference as a supplement to an right. nitrogen program. So, so I'll, I'll start with the basic premise is that, that, that eventually any form you apply is going to be plant available and the plant isn't going to care whether it's taking it up as ammonium or nitrate. So ammonium or nitrate are the two plant available forms of, of nitrogen. Ammonium is nice because it's positively charged. It's held by the soil. It's not considered to be leachable. The, the problem is we cannot permanently hold nitrogen in the ammonium form. Now, the nice thing about using something other than anhydrous is you're going to get some ammonium nitrogen. Now, whatever you apply as ammonium, through no action on your part, it's just going to happen. You can't stop it. You can buy some stuff to try to slow it down, try to delay it. It's going to turn into nitrate. So eventually, in a natural soil environment, nitrate is the eventual form of, of, of all nitrogen. Now, the plant might grab it while it's still in the ammonium form. The soil can hold it during the period of time that it's in the ammonium form. If we could ever develop a product that would keep nitrogen in an ammonium form season long, that would be awesome. Because once it gets to nitrate, that's when all the bad stuff starts to happen from a, from a nitrogen standpoint. Um, you know, there are pro products that slow down or, or stop for a period of time. The nitrogen uh, nitrification process, that lengthens the amount of time before nitrogen gets into the nitrate form. So I, I kind of got in the weeds there to answer uh, your question directly. Um, the nitrogen that is in UAN is a mixture of ammonium and nitrate. That's where urea ammonium nitrate comes from. So you've got some urea, you got some ammonium, you got some nitrate, about half quarter quarter, as, as I recall. So, so the nitrogen, half the nitrogen you apply as UAN is available the day you put it on to the plant. None of the nitrogen you apply as urea is available to the plant the day you put it on, but relatively quickly, quicker than anhydrous, it's going to get into that ammonium plant available form. And then it's going to start the process of converting the nitrate. So in theory, Urea will last a little longer than UAN is going to uh, because it's going to take a little longer for the urea to get to the nitrate form. Some of the UAN is already nitrate the day you put it on. Some of the UAN is urea the day you put it on. 
Um, so, so UAN has, you know, really three different forms of nitrogen in it. Some of, you know, half of it's plant available day one, half of it is not. Um, there is less potential for volatile loss from UAN because only half, you know, if you lose 100% of your losable UAN, you're going to lose half of what you put on. You can't possibly lose all of your UAN through volatile loss. You can, you, you won't, but in theory, it is possible to lose 100% of urea to volatile loss. Not going to happen, but it could happen. So your, your potential for volatile loss is greater with the urea. With both of them, they either need to be incorporated or use a urease inhibitor. Urease is a naturally occurring soil enzyme. That's what's going to cause the volatile loss. If you inhibit that enzyme until that nitrogen gets attached to a soil particle or incorporated into the soil through tillage or rainfall, you know, then you can really minimize those losses. So long-winded answer there. At the end of the day, you could create scenarios where it would matter. You can't control the weather. So you can't control the scenario to make it matter. So at the end, I don't really care. I would say let, you know, ease of application, availability of equipment, availability. You know, it's not always possible to find urea. Not, not everybody stocks urea all the time. Um, it's usually easier to find UAN. Um, there are times when urea is a better buy than UAN. There are times when the market gets kind of wonky and UAN is cheaper than urea. So, so I would say, you know, there's other, there's, there's other forms too. There's ammonium sulfate. There's, um, what's the, what's the one nobody wants to carry because you make a bomb out of it. Um, ammonium nitrate. Oh, yeah. So, so ammonium nitrate used to be more, more common. It's, it's hard to inventory ammonium nitrate these days with uh, all the bad things somebody might do with it. Um, it's hell to get old, by the way, kids, you, you, you forget things that you know, and it drives you crazy. But, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, every form of nitrogen has pros and cons. And, and you can create scenarios, hypothetically, where this form will outperform that form if this happens or if that happens. The problem is we're out there in a biological system in, in a world controlled by Mother Nature you know, you're not in charge of the things that are going to make a difference what form you apply. So at the end of the day, it usually doesn't matter. The corn plant doesn't care. The only thing corn plant cares is it wants the amount of nitrogen that it wants on a daily basis. It doesn't care what form it came from. It doesn't care what you paid for it. It doesn't even care where or how you applied it, as long as it's where it can get at it when it wants it. Uh I think the moral of the story there is timing of that availability, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and every year, the timing of the need of that availability differs. Yeah. So yep. that's when I think you can start to differentiate one source from another on what is available at what point in yep. time, but you never know that ahead of time. Yep. Yep. You never yeah. Know I mean, I mean, I, I, I would say from a, uh, I have to be a little careful here. So, I mean, ammonium nitrate, ammonium sulfate, UAN, urea, and hydrous. That would be most to least available the day you apply it. So, and, and then you've got the, where do you apply it? You know, is it a band? Is it broadcast? Are you using a, a, um, um, a Y drop where you're getting it right at the base of the plant? Are you banding it under the plant close to the roots? Are you broadcasting? Is it a band out in the middle of the road that you're going to have to grow to? So, <clears throat> so I would say the form of nitrogen impacts availability placement of nitrogen probably impacts it more than form does. And then the weather impacts all the above. And, and that's what gets so difficult with nitrogen is the, you know, the, the type you choose or the form you choose, the way you apply it, where you place it, and the weather that occurs after you do it is what's going to determine the outcome. 
and and you can't control all those variables unfortunately yeah and, and to that notion we have another question come in about if you have he's, he's giving me a scenario if you got 165 actual in okay. and you're going to side dress uan 35 units to get a 200 total okay with that much being on already that 165 yeah does the timing become less important if you have front loaded your system more? Yes. Yeah. In yes. that scenario. Um, yes, I would say it does. I would also say if I can, <clears throat> if, if, if I can offer a suggestion, I would reduce that number to give you more flexibility here. So, <clears throat> You know, if, if you, and, and I get this question a lot, what, what's my favorite nitrogen program? And I might've told this joke on here before, <clears throat> but a good joke can be told more than once in my opinion. So, so, so if you ask me, my favorite nitrogen program is, is half quarter quarter. This would be half fall or early pre-plant. So, so I'm not, I'm not necessarily a, a fall pusher. You know, if you want to try to get nitrogen on in March, you know, if, if, if you've got soils that allow for that, not, nothing wrong with that quarter at planting quarter side dress. So the at planting could be UAN carrier that we talked about. It could be starter on the planter. Side dress could be, you know, a, a, a row and go like at, you know, V1. Uh, you could come back uh, more like a V5. You you could do maybe a V7 or, or 8. Um, you could broadcast urea anytime. Uh, you could do Y drops on, on bigger corn. Um, I mean, you... <laughs> The, the the timings and the ways you can do side dress nitrogen are as bad as numerous as there are you know for farmers out there and everybody's going to have their own opinion and, and you can create scenarios where any of those are good or any of those are bad um, <clears throat> but if you put too much on in this pass it causes you to do one of two things you either limit your options here or you're putting on too much nitrogen because if, if you only want to put on 200 units total, which is, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that number. And you've only left yourself 35 units to play with here. You, you know, there's no point in going out and putting on 10 pounds. You know, if, if I'm going to apply nitrogen to the soil, I'm probably not going to waste my time doing less than 30 units on a, on a pass. You know, the, the time and the labor and the expense of making the application, it's not worth doing to run out there and put on another 10 pounds of nitrogen. So I want to save myself at least 30 units for, for a pass. So if my number total number is 200 and I want to do 45 here and I want to do 45 here, the most I can do up here is 110 or you're going to overshoot your mark of, of 200. So, so if you like this three shots of nitrogen program, you, you got to keep the fall part or the early part fairly low, or, or you're going to end up putting on way more nitrogen than you need. Now, now the joke part of this story is the, the far, a farmer one time asked me what, what, what I liked. And, um, and this guy, very good corn farmer, uh, raises some phenomenal corn. And, and he agreed with me that he really liked that half quarter quarter. But here was his caveat. They had about 2,000 acres of corn in the side dress. <clears throat> they were always nervous that, well, what happens if we don't get our side dress done? So his solution was his nitrogen program is half, half quarter. So, so his side dress is supplemental nitrogen. Because in theory, he already had everything he needed between fall and spring. And if he got the side dress done, then he was actually at 125% of what he actually needed. <clears throat> so 
You can raise good corn that way, but probably over applying nitrogen. So great, lo lo love the questions. Off to a good start to the new season with some good questions coming in. So anything else, Adam, come in? No nope. question wise? No. Nope. Okay, so <clears throat> where are we at on time? We're uh, we're well, we're at time. We're I'll, I'll, we'll do one more quick one here, and we'll 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 end, we'll end on a low note, and we'll probably irritate somebody, and and maybe Adam will be sad that he suggested that we maybe talk about this. <clears throat> but this is we are we are in the time of year where farmers get paralyzed, um, and dealers get frustrated, and salesmen get frustrated because everybody's trying to find the seed size that they think they absolutely have to have to be successful raising corn. And if we could make every bag of corn we sell a 52 pound round, we would make everybody that likes rounds happy. If we could make every bag of corn we sell a 48 pound flat, we'd make everybody that likes flats happy. So even in those two scenarios, we're not going to make everybody happy uh, because some guys like rounds, some guys like flats. I'll tell you a little secret. It don't matter whether it's flat or round from a corn yield standpoint. Now, are there planters that have meters that maybe prefer rounds versus flats? Perhaps. Are there planters that plant a 60 pound seed better than they plant 38 pound seed? Yes. Are there planters that plant 38 pound seed better than they plant 60 pound seed? Yes. Are there farmers that don't like carrying 66 pound bags of corn? Absolutely. Um, I, I used to like to show off I could carry two 66 pound bags of corn. Now I don't even like carrying one. So I, I, I get it. Everybody's got their preference. And, and the preference is typically driven by what that fancy planter monitor tells you your singulation rate is. And we all want that singulation to be 99% plus, right? And if you've been planting along with a hybrid and it's reading 99%, 99.8, and you're like, oh, I feel really good about the fortune I spent on this planter. I feel really good about uh, my adjustments and my settings. And you dump in that seed size that you didn't really want, but you took it because that's all we could get you. And that singulation drops to 97.9. And you are on the phone with this corn that won't plant. I, I will, this is, this is where we're going to irritate some people. I will tell you that in most cases, the difference between 97.9% singulation and 99 plus percent singulation at the end of the day is not going to be your yield limiting factor. Something else that happens in that field throughout the rest of the growing season is going to impact your yield more than a one point some percent difference in singulation. Would it be nice to have perfect singulation? Yes. More important to have uniform emergence than it is uniform spacing. More important to have the right hybrid than either of those. More important to have the right management through the rest of the season than either of those. And more important to have some good weather than anything else we've talked about uh, up, up here today. So, <clears throat> so there's, you know, we do the best we can to get you the seed size you want. We're not always going to be able to accomplish it. I've seen guys actually switch hybrids to get the seed size they want. And, and so in some cases they switch to the wrong hybrid because the wrong hybrid was available in the seed size they want. Don't do that. You know, Stay with the right hybrid. If you have to grimace a little bit and accept the seed size that wasn't your favorite, you know, I, I think all these good planters that you guys are running, I think they'll plant anything we grow. Um, maybe they need to be tweaked. Maybe they need adjusted. Maybe we need a different plate. Maybe we need a different setting. Maybe we need to adjust something. You know, <clears throat> my $30,000 planter will plant everything I put in it. If your $600,000 planter will not plant everything you put in it, I'd be talking to somebody about that if I was you. So anyway, just a little just a little pep talk here on, on seed size, because my guess is some of you are going to be talking to a dealer and you're probably going to be looking at a round that you wish was a flat or you're going to be looking at a flat that you wish was around or you're going to be looking at something that weighs 63 pounds. It was supposed to not be over 50. 
you told your dealer, you told us, we know, yet we still didn't quite get what you were looking for. Um, we do the best we can, but uh, ha have a little grace related to seed size, bag weight, seed shape, um, spacing, and um, and preciseness of planting as we get into spring planting season. So with that, thanks for being here with us today. Thanks for all the questions. Any last minute questions, Adam? No last minute questions. Okay. Uh, we'll be back on the 26th. Thank you. Yes. So 26th of January. So we'll have one more episode of Ask the Agronomist before our Yield Chaser Banquet. So we'll remind you about that again on the next episode. Be back with us. Come prepared with your questions. As always, I'd say, you know, if you appreciate this type of conversation and information that we're providing here, uh, give us a thumbs up on YouTube and hit that subscribe button. Get signed up uh, by hitting the notification bell. That way, whenever we're on Ask the Agronomist, it'll pop up on your phone if you've got time to participate. As Lance has said many times, we love your participation, your questions. So, Yep. Every episode is available, recorded. You can watch them anytime, but you can only ask questions live if you're here with us live. And, uh, and that's what we appreciate. So. Everybody have a, uh, a great week. Uh, stay safe and we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks.